Hello and welcome to this Forum for Philosophy LSE event on comedy. It's co-sponsored by the Royal Institute of Philosophy and the Centre for Philosophy and Visual Art at King's College London. We have a hashtag, hashtag LSE Forum, and a handle at Forum Philosophy. Do tweet along. We welcome your questions for our speakers and you can submit them via the Q&A box on Zoom or if you're watching live on Facebook, you can leave us a question there. My name is Sarah Fine. I'm a fellow at the Forum for Philosophy and I teach philosophy at King's College London. So what is comedy? What have philosophers said about it? And what's the role and the value of comedy in our lives? With me to discuss comedy and philosophy, we have a wonderful panel and I'm delighted to welcome them to the forum. Robert Newman is a com comedian and writer. He's the author of The Trade Secret and the entirely accurate encyclopedia of evolution. His recent work includes Total Eclipse of Descartes and Half Full both broadcast on BBC Radio 4. Five questions about themselves. Zoe Walker is Director of Studies in Philosophy and a College Lecturer in Philosophy at Magdalen College, Cambridge. She's writing a PhD on the philosophy of humour. Thank you all so much for joining us. So first I'd like to ask our panel, what is comedy? And Zoe, would you mind get us, getting us started with that particular question? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you. So that's a big question. And I think there are lots of different ways that you could go with it. Um, so I'm gonna start with a kind of simple, answer, which is uh, that I think comedy is the art of amusing people. Um, and then I can say a little bit more about uh, some different aspects of that. Uh, so first of all, when I say that uh, comedy is an art, part of what I really want to emphasize uh, about that is that, at least as I think of comedy, um, what distinguishes it from kind of humor more generally, uh, is that it is intentional. Um, so it's a kind of deliberate attempt to create humour, a uh, deliberate attempt to make people laugh, as opposed to, you know, these kind of humorous accidents, I guess. Um, and I think that intention makes a really interesting difference. Um, so I think there's a really big difference between, you know, deliberately making someone laugh and accidentally doing so. That's more or less the difference between um, having people laugh with you and having them laugh at you. Um, and I think we're all familiar that the former is one of the best feelings in the world and the latter probably one of the worst feelings in the world. Um, and I think it's partly intention which kind of explains those feelings. So in the former case, people kind of recognizing your intention and enjoying it, you feel like your agency is really being affirmed. You're the author of this humorous episode. Uh, whereas in the other case, uh, you're this kind of object of humour. It really feels in that moment as though people are viewing you as this kind of thing um, and probably a kind of malfunctioning thing if they're laughing at you. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we often try to make fun of ourselves before anyone else can to kind of take ownership of that funny episode uh, or we might retell an embarrassing thing that happened to us again to kind of take ownership of it. Um, and I think one other thing to mention on this kind of intention topic is that I think there's also a kind of awkward intermediary situation that can happen where um, people misread your intention um, as a comedian and they take your joke in a way that you didn't intend it to, to read. That's not what you meant. Um, so it's not, they're not exactly laughing at you, but they're not exactly laughing with you either. And I think there's an interesting kind of problem in determining when that happens, what was the joke? Was it what the comedian meant for it to be or what the audience took it to be? Um, and my feeling on that is that uh, it's what a kind of reasonable audience takes the joke to be, but I'd be interested to hear what the others think about that. Um, and then the other side of what I kind of said at the beginning was 
that comedy aims at amusing people. Um, and so I think that's what distinguishes it from uh, other arts. So horror aims at scaring people or uh, tragedy aims at evoking pathos. Um, but crucially, when I say that it's the aim that is what makes comedy distinct, what I'm not saying is that it's the subject matter that makes comedy distinct. Um, because I don't think there are any subject matters that are kind of objectively funny or objectively not funny. Uh, rather, I think that comedy is a kind of um, perspective or a lens through which you can view any subject matter. Um, and that's a lens that's going to be kind of detached and a bit more objective. Um, you're going to be looking for the absurdities in a situation uh, and getting kind of amused pleasure from those. And I think that's how, um, because this can be applied to any subject matter, we can get comedy even from kind of very tragic uh, circumstances. So for example, the comedian Tig Notaro has this amazing stand-up set where she talks about uh, how she's just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And that's she makes it really hilarious, but the tragedy of the situation is always at the forefront. So I think it's only by thinking of comedy as a kind of lens rather than the subject matter that we can make sense of that. Um, and interestingly, I actually think this is something that comedy has in common with philosophy. I think philosophy too, is not a subject matter, but rather a way of looking at uh, any other kind of subject matter and similarly aspires to be kind of detached, uh, to look for the absurdities and I guess hopefully to get some pleasure out of them as well. Brilliant, thank you so much Zoe. That's an excellent jumping off point for us. Uh, Kieran, can I bring you into the conversation here? Do you have any response to Zoe's opening remarks? Um, well, that was really brilliant. I mean, I think it's an enormously difficult challenge to do what Zoe just did and say something informative and illuminating about comedy in general, partly because of the reason she gave that it doesn't have, it, it seems that there can be comedy about almost anything. And I mean, I, I mean, another kind of approach to this would, would sort of start from the, the tragedy that, you know, Aristotle's poetics uh, focuses on tragedy, and there's there's a sort of a, a lost second book that may, may have been the the bit where Aristotle gave us the secret of comedy, but unfortunately it doesn't survive. And uh, I suppose if it had, there'd be no need for us to, to to have this event, which would be which would be a you know uh, which would be a tragedy. So, um, but I mean, there's a sort of idea there of comedy as a genre of kind of dramatic art. And one thing that uh, Zoe's account gave gave us was a kind of much more general picture. And one thing I find interesting about comedy is that there, there's sort of comedy as comedic theater. There's also stand-up comedy, which I suppose is the, the kind of comedy I most, I most drawn to. And so it, 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 it's sort of a bunch of sort of historical genres that do the kind of thing that Zoe's describing. And I, the other thing I, I, I wanted to sort of pick up on about stand-up in particular that really interests me, and this is really a, a question um, is about sort of intention and sincerity. Because one of the things I really find fascinating about the way stand-up comedy often operates is that it's a bit like um, auto fiction or something. It's the stand-up comedians, sometimes they play a character with a name like Al Murray, the pub landlord or something, but often stand-ups sort of play a version of themselves. And so exactly what their intentions are and how, what the relation is between their comic persona and themselves in relation to sort of th their intentions and sort of whether they're whether they are whether we're laughing with them or laughing at them gets very blurry often and I, I find that kind of one of the delights of stand up but also um, I suppose I have a puzzle about about how how that fits together with the the very useful sort of framework that Zoe gave us. Thank you, Karen. Well, this seems like a perfect place to bring in Robert. Uh, do you have any thoughts in response to what we've heard so far? I'll have to invite you to unmute, Robert, because we got muted at the beginning. There we go. Forgive me. Well, uh, um, I thought both excellent comments and um, Zoe, you did, it was, um, you made a much um, better fist of defining um, comedy than Freud makes. Freud is, um, <laughs> unintentionally hilarious in trying to define humor. And he sounds like, if you remember them, that great character, Dr. Lilith Sternin in Cheers, this wonderfully humorless psychiatrist. Um, Freud says, um, humor can take place in 
two ways. Um, it can take, it may take place in, the, in, in, in regard to a single person who himself um, assumes the humorous attitude while a second person plays the part of the spectator who derives enjoyment from it, or it may take place involving two persons, one of whom takes no part at all in the humorous process, but is made the object of humorous contemplation by the other. So there you have it. There's two ways of being funny involving four people with them, and only three of them are going to get any joy out of it. So <laughs> have comedy placed on a firm mathematical footing. But I, did, I, I, think, um, I, I, th I think what Zoe did was much, much more worthwhile. Um, I, I share Kieran's uh, bafflement about, and, I, and love of that, blurring of lines, like with a singer-songwriter or with a poet, you know, the, the truest poetry is the most feigning, as Auden says. Um, that's, that's, that's part of the, of the joy, joy of it is, 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 and part of the game played with the audience, I suppose, is when, when the person, um, when, the, when the comedian peeps through the, the persona, or, you, know, or, you know, especially if they're playing someone um, very ingenuous, um, if I can, can I just quote a, a joke? Um, I haven't, uh, uh, which I do. Please do. Better. Nervously, I, it's, it's, it's a joke I saw 25 years ago by that legendary Northern Irish comedian, um, Kevin McAleer, but I was thinking about it because it's a philosophical joke, I think. And it was, it was, a, it was at the height of the Troubles and, and he talked about, uh, it, it, was, it, it was when young man, he went, went for a walk up into the Green Hills above Belfast and, um, and he sat up there and he looked at the, the starry heavens and so infinite and and eternal and he, and he he asked himself you know who am i why am i here and then uh, kevin mcclay says at that moment a british army land rover pulled up and these this young squad he jumped out and he came up to me and said who are you why are you here and i felt <laughs> here was a who was a fellow spirit here was another young man wrestling with the same questions with <laughs> and and it's sort of and and from then on it goes. There's a beautiful dance where, where where they take him to the to the cells, and he thinks this is more of a uh, more f philosophy. But it's sort of beautiful because because you've got wide-eyed and frank and gentle and open and very human uh, Kevin MacLear in this situation, but you've also got a little Morse code happening be be between the audience and and, and him too. Mm. That's really fascinating. Thank you. And I wonder if we could come back to Zoe and where you were drawing the connections between philosophy and comedy. So I, I wonder then, so how do we know how to tell the difference between them when we have a, you know, a kind of very funny philosopher, like say, for example, G.A. Cohen, Jerry Cohen, who was well known for doing sort of philosophy style <laughs> routines. How do we know whether we're watching comedy or we're watching philosophy? And does it even matter? <laughs> um, I think that often, definitely the two can overlap. And I think certainly my favorite Philosophy is um, kind of witty and probably maybe my favourite comedy has philosophical uh, notes to it as well. Um, I suppose that I would, I would want to say maybe philosophers tend to be trying to kind of resolve the absurdities that they find um, to kind of give answers in a way that comedians maybe don't necessarily, I don't know if uh, Robert would disagree with this, but often, you know, they have the kind of fun part is noticing that something's kind of absurd and it can be comedy if you just leave it at that. Um, and then maybe the philosophy comes in to say, okay, how do we uh, straighten this out? I guess like, that could be part of the difference maybe. But yeah. That's I, great. I, I'd say that um, where it's, for some comedians, it comedies and like for some philosophers is a celebration of the fact that from the crooked timber of humanity no straight thing was ever made in, in Kant's uh, famous phrase but I, I hesitate to before saying that's a celebration because for a lot of comedians as for a lot of philosophers that's quite annoying and they then they spend a lot of energy trying to straighten things out or they wish that things were there was a bit bit more straight um, um, uh, 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 tim timber going on um, uh, mm. That's really also, interesting. And, and coming back to what you were saying, Kieran, what you, you, oh, I was you were say, commenting on a more, a, more, a more mundane thing, which is that like 
that the format of the philosophy, I've often been struck by the fact that the format of the philosophy lecture is like, it's, it's like a 50 minute stand up set. And my, my colleague, who, Steve Yablo, who's extraordinarily funny, once said that one thing he loved about teaching was that it was stand up with very low expectations. Uh, the <laughs> students are grateful. And any, any attempt at humor is received as a kind of relief from the, the dreadful monotony. And I, I sort of resonate to that. There is, there's something just structurally similar about, about uh, that kind of get, giving a talk um, and what, what yeah. comedians do. And it's sort of scripted, but supposed to seem spontaneous, you know, that, 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 that side of things where you've got your notes and you, but you want it to seem a little bit fresh, like you're sort of thinking through the problem on the spot, but you might've given that lecture a hundred times or 20 times, you know, which is again, part of the, <laughs> the curiosity of things stands on stage is the sp sense of spontaneity, the acted spontaneity, which is very, uh, again, very puzzling and, and magical. And what about what you were saying about the persona? So you oh. were saying that, you know, there's something interesting about the way in which stand-up comedians often have a persona. It's not necessarily a different name, you know, they're, they're just sort of acting themselves. And one of the things that's quite interesting about your podcast is that you're sort of inviting philosophers to peel back the mask and to say kind of quite intimate things about themselves and how they came to philosophy. So uh, do you think that maybe... Uh, philosophers also perform themselves in a way oh. and I mean I suppose yes but then I in a kind of way that I mean maybe this is too glib but like in the in, in the same way that almost everyone is in in different venues performing versions of themselves certainly I, I mean thinking about teaching I don't know if, if Zoe agrees with this I feel like one of the ways I got comfortable teaching was thinking um I this is the bit where I play a teacher and I was like okay I kind of know how a teacher behaves I know how to do that so uh, once I thought about that as being the role that I would inhabit in the classroom, I thought oh, I, I was I felt kind of able to do things that I'd probably be too sh shy to do as me or something. And uh, and so my relation to teaching changed when I thought of myself as as playing this this teacherly role. And I suppose there are versions of that that philosophers do, but other academics do probably too in professional contexts. But I kind of think that might be just a more general <laughs> phenomenon of people performing versions of themselves for different kinds of audiences. Philosophers can learn from comedy and what comedians can learn from philosophy. And I know, Robert, that you think that there are some important things that philosophers get wrong about comedy. So would you mind getting us started with this one? On, 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 on what, what philosophers might sometimes get wrong about. about. Yes, exactly. Um, um, well, it's not just philosophers. I think as a culture, we have very thin ideas about our joys. And this makes us too ready to relinquish the understanding of them to those people who come along with very reductive and dehumanizing explanations for why these are joys and delights of us. And which usually, and these explanations, um, usually focus on the alloy tarnishing this joy which and rather than the joy itself which usually disappears and um and people tend to pathologize comedy either it's um with say bergson it's the lack of emotion dissociation affect or if emotions are there to be expressed then it's uh aggression or uh, it's very, it's this, and it's very unhelpful um, metaphor of um, of, the, of the safety valve. And I suppose this this sort of um, uh, an evolutionary psychology has been a big big vector of this entering entering the the, the the public conversation. And and I suppose the apotheosis of this would be someone like let's say a V.S. Ramachandran, in his who's described by Time magazine as one of the hundred most influential things in the world, and. Uh, readers of his book Phantoms of the Brain will learn that um, laughter uh, is an aborted snarl. Uh, smiling evolved as an aborted snarl. What he says was, is um, when one of your ancestral primates encountered an individual coming towards him from a distance, he would have bared his canines in a threatening grimace on the fair assumption that most strangers are potential enemies. Upon recognizing the individual as friend or kin, however, he might abort the threatening start, snarl halfway, thereby producing a snarl, which you, uh, thereby producing a smile, a, which, which evolved into a ritualized human greeting. Now, of course, evidence for this has he none. And 
and and just to say that this he's not like a lone odd god this is this is um if you a couple of years ago new york review of books did a a standalone essay it wasn't even a review review of a book about what about how the roots of comedy lie in aggression and and their um uh, and and they rather eccentrically spent a lot of time on this um 1950s entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica, in which we which was looking at how Hogarth's 17th, 18th century engravings of pub scenes of people laughing show us that, that the roots of comedy lie in aggression. And what this says was it was this was a, a depiction of the brutal merriment of a tavern, and then it says that the contorted grimaces of their face muscles uh, show that the emotions being disposed uh, through this safety valve are brutality envy and aggression and uh, through the uh, the addition of um uh, face muscles is is pure scientism to give you the sense that this is uh, anatomical and of course it tells us nothing of the sort about the roots of comedy all it tells us about is hogarth's crude snobbery his misanthropy his ability to draw individuated humans beyond alleg allegorical stick figures and um and the, and the 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 so those might be the say the thick form forms of that. The thin form would be the way that everybody says, "Oh, every joke has to have a victim." Or you know, every you know the punchline, and and um, and this is, um, you know, a conversational cliche. Of course, it's not true. Um, if I just give one, I did, I could give examples. If if I don't, if if, if you don't, I mean, just just uh, these aren't. I've scoured the whole of the canon looking for two examples, and I've found them. But this just happened to be. Uh, enjoying these two uh, later on. There's a beautiful Dimitri Martin uh, uh, stand-up where he talks about how um, he loves video game pieces, but they're so violent. I want to design a video game where you look after all the people hurt in all the other video games. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> super busy hospital. So I'm a bit busy. There's, there's a guy who's been shot 57 times in the head. And oh, the last bit, I'll give you the last bit. But, but <laughs> busy hospital, you, you have to perform quite a lot of mental acrobatics to, before you say, oh, that's... Uh, that's a joke with a victim. And similarly, in Robin Williams's uh, legendary stand-up show, Live at the Met, where he's talking about the, the miracle of conception. And he talks about the moment the sperm cell um, 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 fertilizes the egg cell. And he says, and he says, um, at that moment, he says, you've got a chromosome square dance. And at that moment, there's not a big laugh, but there is what John Dewey, who writes brilliantly about comedy, by the way, of all people, Dewey says there's a field effect. Something there's a field effect, and everyone's waiting, you know, for this for the punchline, and, it's, and everyone loving the idea and just wanting to know what he's doing with it. And then suddenly he does this. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, he just does this line dance. He does kind of a hoedown. He just goes, 23 chromosomes coming down, 23 chromosomes spinning around. Tragically, he actually says 24 chromosomes, but never mind. And then, and it's just so a dominant gene means hair is brown. This, but there we're just laughing at the sheer exuberance. There's just the delight of that visual image. In the same, it's this very similar to the delight of a magnificent core change of a beautiful, perfect image in a poem. And, um, and, and is not to be traduced by um, uh, uh, um, these very reductive ideas of of, of every of every, you know how it's 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 aggression in disguise or it's um you know or it's or or it's a complete lack of emotion you know with uh, you know um uh, uh, I mean that's if we've got time I'd like to talk talk, talk about that as well uh, how um it's it's it, that's you know in Bergson's catastrophic essay laughter. Um, catastrophic because it was a big influence on Freud as well that idea that you know laughter has no greater foe than the emotion or uh, the absence of feeling usually accompanies laughter I mean it's um uh, it, it's 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 um I mean I think that's that's um it's a tin ear for the for the types of fellow the fact that laughter I believe is is a fellow feeling um and um, Darwin believes that laughter is a joyful coming together. La Darwin spends a lot of time looking at the uh, at the origins of, of of laughter, and I think um, uh, um, and uh, the, the, the Rostislav Uranev in the Mechanics of Funny in the nineteen sixties, this uh, Russian, who's actually a film historian, but said you know laughter can be joyful or sad, funny and irate, tender or rough, um, warm, uh, kind hearted, cold. But there can even be melancholy laughter. So I think it's very emotional. And then, and I think it would be a really useful study to look at the texture, the time, but the tone of different laughs, because um, that's what's missing, I think, from a lot of accounts of comedy is, is the extent to which it is. Because it wouldn't be funny if we didn't bring emotions 
to share, we, we weren't sharing experience. As members of the audience, if you weren't sharing experience, it wouldn't be funny. And so, and I think that's um, a present company very much accepted what is missing from many philosophical accounts of comedy. Thank you, Robert, that was fantastic. And I'd like to bring in Karen again here because Karen has a wonderful series on um, reviews of stand-up comedy routines live during coronavirus. And I wonder if you could just say a little something about what drew you to stand-up comedy during that period and how that might respond to what Robert has just been saying. I mean, actually, I mean, that the series I, I did this series of very short essays that that were about sort of comedy under lockdown and missing missing live performance and some of it I think is just the form of live performance that I most like is stand up so I wrote about stand up and and the ways in which the sort of physicality and sort of mutual the sort of common presence of it doesn't transmit very well it's very hard to recreate online and about comedians who had not done that well and comedians who I think have, have really managed to, to do it. I mean, I, I think some of that has to do with things Robert is pointing to, like the, the kind of somatic side of shared emotion, which is, it's it, it's possible, but it's challenged when you're, you're um, interacting sort of virtually rather than in person, like you have to find ways to, to do it. Um, but I'm, I'm mostly, I, I'm sort of, uh, um, I mean, there is some kind of affinity between philosophy and comedy, but it's very hard to to pinpoint. And this goes back to things that Zoe raised. I mean, the, the, the kind of philosophical, I mean, Robert's talked about the, the sort of relief of pent-up tension theory, the superiority and aggression theory and their, their shortcomings. The other big philosophical theory of humor is the incongruity theory that involves some kind of incongruity. You find that in Hutchison and Kant and Schopenhauer. And as a theory, I don't think it is particularly great in that incongruity can be all kinds of things. It can be comic, but it can also be tragic or just puzzling or, um, so I, as a theory of comedy, it doesn't really work, but I do think it, it points towards something uh, of the affinity between philosophical puzzles and comedy. Uh, but I, I'm not sure I could put my finger on, on why that feels so fruitful to me. I don't know, I, maybe Zoe has more to say about this because I think she was also pointing to this kind of connection. Well, let's go Zoe and then back to Robert again. Um, so, well, something I was thinking after what Robert was saying, um, well, firstly, I think that we partly have Plato to thank or blame for the, the kind of pessimistic treatment of um, comedy and humour in philosophy. Um, I think he was very much, um, say, you know, advocated this kind of superiority theory that you're trying to get a one over on someone and it's kind of cruel. Um, although interestingly, Socrates in, in the Platonic dialogues often is quite funny and not necessarily in the way that Plato seemed to think all humor happened. So maybe Plato was being funny without intending to there if he didn't, if he didn't see that. But um, yeah, I think um, maybe that's kind of part of the history of it. Um, and also something else I was thinking of, from what Robert was saying was, um, I really like puns and um, I like to tell puns, uh, which not everyone appreciates, but um, someone once told me, oh, did you know that the same part of your brain lights up when you hear a pun as when you're in pain? And that kind of proves that puns are painful or something. It's like, well, it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, that's just like, surely it would be if you felt the feeling of pain, like that's what matters, right? Um, so I, I definitely, <laughs> I think that science can sometimes, uh, or people trying to use science um, can kind of miss like the way things actually are. Um, so I definitely agree about that. I think we need to pay attention to, you know, the way people actually laugh and find things funny. Yeah. That's really interesting. Robert. Well, um, a couple, well, I had a question for both of you because um, as, in, in terms of one of the similarities with, with philosophy and comedy would be, I suppose, the discovery of suppressed premises, which is basically every pullback and reveal joke, right? But I was struck by whether there's something chipper about both endeavours, um, because there's a strange thing that I often think about, and about, I don't know what to, what to think about it, that Bertrand Russell says about, um, he's actually, he's talking about Schopenhauer and he says, He's peculiar among philosophers because um, he's a pessimist, whereas almost all the others are, in some sense, optimists. 
Um, now I know it was, so I was writing in 1945, and since then, you know, um, uh, there were more, more downbeat philosophers. But what did you you think about the the fact that whether and I, and obviously not all stand ups are are optimistic. Of course, many glorious stand ups are wonderfully pessimistic. But what did you think about whether there might be something chipper common to both in, endeavors? Great question. <laughs> yeah, I can say there is there is something sort of quixotically hopeful about philosophy. I mean, it's like the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I mean, sometimes as a philosopher, you feel a bit like like, yep, the problem of free will. Let's let's take another crack at this one. Um, and the, the, the sort of absurdity of th especially the absurdity of thinking that you know, I am going to figure this out when when generations of more brilliant people have have come a cropper on it. But nevertheless, there is something kind of hopeful about the fact that we then just say, well, yeah, we don't really know how to answer this question and all the odds are stacked against us, but let's keep doing it. I mean, it's a bit like, you know, it's like, you know, maybe we're, we're like the, you know, Wiley Coyote or something. We still, we still think we can catch the Roadrunner despite the evidence of, of uh, every other cartoon previously. I don't know. There's something about that, but I don't know. It, 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 yeah. It's funny because I, I, that you would associate, I, I think comed comedians, I mean, I often I haven't really thought about this properly, but I, I guess I, I'm surprised that to sort of think of comedy as optimistic in that there's a that cynicism is often so such a cheap way of being funny. Um, okay, so I'm, at that point, I get stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> Zoe. Um, so yeah, well, well, the first thing that I thought of. Um, was uh, just when I was thinking a bit more about your earlier question about the difference between comedy and philosophy, I was kind of thinking that maybe when we reach these absurdities, a comedian will kind of just like enjoy and kind of revel in the weirdness of it. And that whereas a philosopher will be kind of like worry about it and want to kind of resolve it. And in a sense, that makes the comedian the more kind of lighthearted one because the philosopher's approach is I don't know, it has this kind of gravitas of like, it's a very serious problem that we need to solve. Whereas for comedy, it's like, ooh, just a funny, silly thing. Um, but yeah, I suppose in a way that the philosophical approach is nonetheless more optimistic because saying we don't just have to kind of leave it at that, we can try and um, get somewhere with it. Uh, so I guess I agree uh, with Kieran that there's something kind of maybe more optimistic about philosophy in a way. Brilliant, thank you. And I just want to remind our listeners that they're very welcome to put questions to the speakers in the Q&A or over on Facebook. Right, so I think it might be time now to move on to think a little bit about the role and the value of comedy in our moral, social and political lives. So Kieran, would you mind getting us started with that one? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of different directions one could take this. I, 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 the, the angle I wanted to sort of start with and sort of um, uh, broach for, for Zoe and Robert was a, sort of about the idea of satire and the idea of comedy as potentially a kind of social critique, especially if you think of the kind of social critique in which something that seems natural or inevitable comes to seem weird or optional or conventional or contingent. And th there is a kind of um, thought that there might be an affinity between sort of comedy and that kind of critique. So even there's even um, there's an essay by an anthropologist, Mary Douglas on jokes, in which she defines jokes in a way that suggests that affinity. She says that a joke is a play upon form that affords opportunity for realizing that an accepted pattern has no necessity. And that, I mean, that idea of, of sort of philosophical critique, comedic critique going together has this very long history, it goes way back to the cynics in fourth century BCE Athens doing philosophy, not by writing, but as performance art. So you have, you know, Diogenes of, of Sinopes of living in a jar in the streets and uh, and telling, doing in effect performance arts so of telling, doing jokes. So, you know, um, there are lots of these, but one of my favorites is when he was, he was actually captured and sold as a slave. And when the auctioneer asked, you know, what skills he has to, to try and, you know, sell him to a, a master, he said, uh, my skill is governing men, spread the word in case someone wants to buy a master. And uh, I thought it was a pretty good joke. And uh, 
So people have made sometimes very kind of optimistic, bold claims for the power of comedy as social critique. Um, actually, I think this might be the, the very same article that Robert was referring to earlier, but there's, there was an article in, in the New York Review of Books that, that talks about an Arthur uh, Kostler essay in which he says, um, and I, let me look at the quote, it's something like, under the tyrannies of Hitler in Germany and of Stalin in the Soviet Union, humor was divin driven underground dictators fear laughter more than bombs. So you have this sort of very bold hope for the power of comedy to disrupt authoritarian regimes. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think there are grounds for doubt about comedy's real role in that uh, respect. I mean, on the one hand, dictators might fear laughter or they might just dislike it and have no need to put up with it. And it's, it's just very actually not so clear to me that comedy really makes a difference in the kind of way we might hope social critique does. I mean, maybe there are cases, there are cases and cases, like I was thinking of Ahmed al-Bashir and the al-Bashir show in Iraq, which really does seem to have played a role in the current protests. But I'm not sure that there are actually that many examples of comedy effectively making change in this kind of way. And in fact, the, the Mary Douglas essay, which draws this affinity actually continues by saying that you know jokes are frivolous because they produce no real alternative only an exhilarating sense of freedom from form in general so she's worried that it's sort of an illusion of of change so you, you can imagine sort of adapting Marx you know that the comedians have only joked about the world and the point is to change it um and I think that's a so there's, there's reasons to worry about whether comedy really works as social critique um so on the other hand third hand here's, here's, here's a sort of more optimistic take I mean Start from the, the fact that, you know, as that little adaptation of Marx indicates, it's not clear that the philosophers have done so much better. So we're not really in a position to mock. And that, I mean, there's a kind of standard complaint about political comedy often that it won't work as social critique because it's preaching to the choir. This is the kind of complaint people sometimes make about The Daily Show or The MASH Report or Last Week Tonight. Um, is a great Simon Munnery, um, he's a comedian, he had, he had a great line that if the crowd gets behind you, you're probably facing the wrong way, uh, which sort of <laughs> captures this, this concern that, that you know, preaching to the choir is, is futile. But I actually think you know, preaching to the choir has tremendous value. I mean, there are goals other than persuading people. Sometimes it's about instruction and comedians can be a wonderful teachers. And sometimes I think, when I think about the social value of comedy, what seems most important to me is communion and solidarity and consolation. And that's something that the, the choir need. We need to sort of whistle together in the dark. And that's something comedy can provide. So I, I have two examples of that that sort of, for me, are, are really emblematic, a little one and a, and a very big one. I mean, what, right after the 2016 election, I remember going to the Paradise Rock Club in Boston and upon an Anchola, who's a comedian I really like, was opening for Eugene Merman. And she, she opened by talking about uh, suffering from anxiety disorder, uh, and then related it to the the moment of the of Trump's election, and said, you know, this is what we train for, guys. This is our Olympics. And there was this moment in the room of people, sort of a kind of shared exhalation, that uh, was brief and maybe momentary and maybe not lasting, but felt important to me as as a kind of consolation that comedy provided. And as I said, that's a very small case, but there there are also kind of astonishing venues in which comedy has provided consolation. So there's a book that actually Sarah pointed me to uh, in an essay of hers that I read um, uh, a year or so ago, I think. Um, she pointed me to a book called Landscapes of the Metropolis of Death by Otto Dov Kulka, who was, um, who was a child in Auschwitz, in the family camp in Auschwitz. And he talks about the way in which art and history and uh, music helped him survive. One of the amazing episodes in that is, is the bits where he's talking about how comedy helped him survive under sort of unimaginably difficult conditions. Um, and he repeats, he says that one of the jokes that they told in Auschwitz was, uh, did you know there's actually a way to escape from here through the smokestacks? Uh, which I had heard that joke before, but I was absolutely sort of staggered to think that it originated among people who were using comedy in the kind of the, the ultimate sort of whistling in the dark. And so for me, it's it sort of the, that is a kind of testament to the, uh, 
power of comedy as a kind of consolation in dark times. And for me, I think that the social value of comedy has, has probably more to do with that, more to do with uh, getting through the worst than with the efficacy in making a political or moral or social difference that I'm not always sure that, that comedy can have. Wow, brilliant. Thank you so much, Karen. And let me invite Zoe to respond. Um, so yeah, that was really interesting. And I think I, I kind of completely agree that two really important things that comedy seems to be able to do are this kind of satire and therefore political critique kind of side of it. And then also the, maybe on a more personal level, the kind of coping with hard times side of it. Um, I have a kind of worries or like other considerations to bring in on both counts. Um, I think I sometimes tend to be a bit pessimistic about things. I'm going to bring that pessimism here and see what you make of it. But um, I suppose one worry with the kind of political critique side of comedy is um, this guy, and I've heard it's not just me, I think I've heard other people worry this as well is that when we kind of laugh about something, we don't take it seriously. And maybe it's important for us to uh, not dismiss a kind of um, bad politician as like a laughing stock because then we don't have that kind of motivating anger and fear that is going to make us make a difference instead we just kind of laugh and like go to bed feeling like maybe it's not all that bad because we've had a good laugh so I guess that's one kind of worry although I still think that comedy can be effective at critiquing I think it's really important to point out like absurdities with uh, things politicians say or do it's just hard to kind of keep that balance between it's funny but we should still be worried kind of thing uh, we don't want to completely let our guard down if you like and then um on the side of coping with things um I'd be interested to hear what you think about this but um obviously well you've probably seen Hannah Gadsby's um stand-up show Nanette and I think in that so her whole thing in that is that she's going to stop doing comedy. Um, and the reason for that is that she feels as though in uh, making comedy out of bad experiences that she's had, she that kind of stops her from properly um, processing them and understanding them and um, kind of resolving them, I suppose, within herself. So her kind of traumatic episodes that she previously made fun of, she realised that in so doing, she made it really hard for herself to properly come to terms with those um, and so I'd be interested to hear what you thought about that because again I'd certainly agree that comedy is a really important way of um, coping with a difficult time but then is there a way to balance that while still you know maybe in the moment we cope and view it in a comedic way but then afterwards we can still kind of um, take it seriously and process it yes. Thanks, Zoe. That's wonderful. I'll come to Robert in, in a moment, but first I'd just like to invite Karen to respond if he wants to. I will try. I'll be very brief. I mean, I, I both of those are really good, important challenges. I mean, I, here's two quick things to say on comedy is sort of trivializing. There's this debate in, as I sometimes work on the ethics of climate change, and there's a debate there about whether um, hopeful communication is the way to go or like David Wallace Wells telling us the world is going to end. And the answer, as far as I can tell, is both. Um, like they, they both work for different people at different times, probably. And so in the same way, I think if the idea was we were only going to joke about something, I can see that might be trivializing, but it's never, it, it's, it's almost always sort of a combination of joking and other things. So uh, that's a kind of one kind of thing to say. The other thing about the Nanette case, there's so much to say about, about um, Hannah Gadsby and Nanette, and I have very mixed feelings about it, so I'm not, but, but I will say this. I mean, I think a related question here is about who can laugh. So in that case, it's one thing for, part of the danger that she was responding to is the sense that other people were laughing in a way that was not the way she might laugh about the subject matter. And the same thing is true about like the Auschwitz joke is kind of an awful, awful joke. Um, and if an, if uh, a neo-Nazi told that joke, that would not be a funny joke. And I feel wary repeating it. But the fact is that was a joke that people, that Otto Dovkulka learned in, in the death camps. But there, right, the question of who, for whom that humor is appropriate and for whom it might be um, 
it might be inappropriate is sort of raised, I think, in a way he, that that's a sort of can of worms that uh, is is open that I won't try to close. <laughs> Thank you, and Robert. Um, one way of maybe answering um, Zoe's point would be to uh, uh, um, quote a, a comedian that, that Kieran mentioned, Simon Munnery, uh, who, who says, um, uh, he says, uh, Socrates says the unexamined life is not worth living. I say, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, um, and there's a problem I share a lot of Zoe's misgivings having uh, with political comedy having uh, uh, um, uh, it's not uh, a lot of the claims made for it uh, are, are, are hollow. Um, the, the, the critique of satire is if you say that this particular uh, this particular incompetent individual is the problem you imply even though you don't you know willy-nilly you imply that were it not for this particular individual the system as it goes will be tickety-boo. But if you feel that the way we're living now is, is a tragic waste of human potential and, and based on the destruction of, 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 the, of the living world, then it doesn't matter who, you know, which, which person is, is at the, and, and so the, and that, and the other problem that political comedy has is, was identified by Emily Dickinson, who says, tell the truth, but tell it slantwise. Now with poets, you feel maybe that's a, an option. With comedians, there's no option that you have to tell it sometimes because the audience can't know where you're coming from. And a lot of um, very respectable and uh, political uh, um, comedians who, who I admire, they, they have the besetting sin of political comedy, which is an over-reliance on the analogy gag. And, you, and, and the problem with that, again, willy-nilly, you end up um, making exactly the sort of speaking up for this, exactly the sort of politics you think you're getting rid of. So uh, I've, I, I have great love and respect for say Stephen Colbert, but one of the, the analogy gags and, and, and for many of the other people, but is they'll look at an absurd government suggestion and they'll say, but in your, in your house, if, you, if this happened in your house or in your local pub or in your, in your family, now, but that is one of the great canards of the right. We saw it recently, we, you, know, you know, one of the, 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 the uh, the, the bastions of austerity economics was to say make this fallacious analogy with the, the family credit card and, and the, you know and, and a lot of economists wrote a sort of joint letter uh, to the to, to the paper saying way, ways in which uh, being able to print your own money or set prices is not like a family credit card um, but and also going back to sort of Menemius in Coriolanus sort of making this very crass analogy with the politics and the body politics and the belly and everything and 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 Shakespeare there is showing that that's a totally uh, a bogus analogy but that's the one which as soon as you do start and doing analogy gags and you do analogy gags because you think well here I don't have to tell it stamp wise you know and it because because here the, you've got this dichotomy between this the the, the serious world of, of of public affairs and the small intimate world of private affairs but you end up um, uh, being hoist by your own petard. Thank you. Wow. Well, we've we've got the audience going because we've had some fantastic questions coming in via the Q and A. So, if I may, I'm I'm going to get us started with one of those, and I'm going to take a question from Rania Nazir, who's asked something that relates to something Zoe raised, I think, and something that I think also relates to um, some of the work you're doing for your PhD, Zoe. So I'll put this question to you first. How does comedy interact with gender, both in terms of the gender of the comedian, but also how comedy is a guise used to disguise harassment, for example, sexist jokes? and to dismiss legitimate social critique and concerns and therefore helps perpetuate the status quo, e.g. I was only joking, why did you take it so personally? Okay, that's a very interesting question and I have many thoughts about that. I think um, certainly the kind of, the, the second part of that, um, this idea when people kind of say, I was just joking. I think that's just, that phrase is just completely misleading because I don't think anyone's ever just joking. Um, so I think, for example, when you make a joke 
uh, you can be kind of drawing on some kind of assumed common ground between you and the other person. And there you're, you're kind of implying things about the real world when you do that, or you're kind of, when you make comedy about something, you're, um, if we come back to the idea of the comedic lens, you're kind of bringing certain aspects of it to the foreground and backgrounding others. Um, and again, I think that's something important you're doing. You're not, you're not just saying a frivolous thing, you're kind of changing and guiding the way that people look at things. Um, so I definitely, I strongly agree with this idea that um, just joking isn't a very good uh, excuse. I think it seems, it seems obvious to me that you can make a joke, um, say something to make people laugh whilst simultaneously kind of uh, conveying information or kind of signaling that you, um, so I think, I think in that case, um, the kind of sexual harassment case or something like that, joking uh, can work like insinuation, I guess, where you put an idea out there, um, but then you can quickly pretend that that wasn't what you meant if it goes down badly and it's a kind of low risk way of saying something. Um, and I think that, you know, people shouldn't be allowed to just kind of avoid accountability for those kind of things. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting question. And then I think um, the idea of gender also is relevant in, so we were just talking about, are there like um, cases where it's okay for some people to laugh and others not to, or I think similarly for some people to tell certain jokes and others not to. Um, and I think that we often think that um, a kind of intuitive thought would be it depends. Um, so let's say there's a joke that's at the expense of women. We think maybe it's OK for a woman to make that joke because it's kind of obvious that she doesn't actually agree with it. And it's kind of satirical or something, whereas it's not OK for a man to say it. And I think something like that is true. I think it can still be possible for say a woman to make a sexist joke and it not to be okay. Um, if, you know, we can kind of, um, this comes back again to the question of how do we determine who the butt of the joke was? What was the intention there? But I think the wider context, often the identity of the speaker will be a guide to that, but it could be if they had said many uh, sexist things in the past, then that would kind of guide us to interpret the joke in a sexist way, in a kind of not okay way, even if the speaker was a woman, for example. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, Karen or Robert, did you want to come in on this? I had two little things to say. Just one is that I think this is another, would add to Zoe's pessimism about comedy as social critique is that it can be used in, in these sort of nefarious responsibility denying ways. If you think about alt-right comedians, this is something that they exploit pretty consistently. And the other tiny thing was if people haven't seen, there's a Bridget Christie bit where she does stand up dressed as an ant about how people say ants can't be funny. Uh, and it's about sort of gender and comedy. Anyway, it's a very, very brilliant uh, bit of stand-up about gender and stand-up, which anyway, that's my, my contribution is to recommend that. Great, thank you. Robert? I just, just, uh, totally agree with um, what Zoe and Kieran have said. There was, um, there was a um, comedy club called Lolitics that had an explicit ban on ironic racism, which mm. I think was right because uh, it was just a way of um, having your cake in it and, and, and eating it. And it was a way of, it was imagining that there was this, that we lived in a sort of statue park where all the racial epith racist epithets were lying around, you know, in disuetude, uh, not used or by anyone, which clearly isn't true. And it's also really just a way of saying, well, I can't be racist because, you know, I went to university. And, and again, that we know that that's not true. And I thought it was... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, and I thought I, I, I was, I, was, I, was, um, I, was a, I thought it was a really cool thing that they did actually. Yeah, great. And and I just wanted to bring in a, a comment raised by uh, Simon Minty here. He says, "I do comedy around disability. I think it helps. It reveals life's absurdities and contradictions. It can make people understand. And I think understanding is something we could explore a bit more." However, I've wondered about the laughter that comes from some of the audience. Am I trivializing complex issues that need to change? When the audience member meets another disabled person like me, will they be cool, relaxed or laugh? 
not a question, but a thought that you've discussed in a different way and made me think more. So I wondered whether anybody wanted to say a little bit about that. Um, I could say something which is that uh, I think something we haven't really explicitly touched on yet is the idea of kind of punching up in comedy. Um, there's this kind of idea that it's okay to um, make jokes at the expense of uh, people in power and not um, at the expense of kind of marginalized people. Um, and I think that how I tend to um, how I tend to kind of think of that is um, that you can have jokes. So if we, we mentioned earlier this incongruity theory, it seems like usually humor come, um, happens when there's something kind of unexpected and absurd. Um, and I think that uh, sometimes we can be, when we kind of point out an absurdity, what we're doing is reinforcing the status quo because we're saying, oh, look, that person doesn't fit in with um everything else and so we're kind of mocking them to i think bergson would say to kind of keep them in line in a way although he used that differently but um on the other hand we can point out absurdities with the status quo and that's how i see the kind of punching up um thing is to say actually the way we currently do things is kind of absurd and incongruous in various ways and i think um I've thought this um, about comedy, about transgender people, for example. I think that there are many comedians, uh, unfortunately, who make jokes about transgender people where the absurd thing is supposed to be uh, at their expense, I suppose, is kind of trying to, so, trying to say, oh, there's something strange about being transgender. And I think that's really abhorrent, but I think that um, there are trans comedians who make jokes about being transgender in a way that's kind of pointing out absurdities with the way things are. Um, and I think that I would maybe think a similar thing about say doing comedy about, about disability is when the kind of butt of the joke is the kind of ridiculous ways that we currently think about people, that seems okay. When the butt of the joke is you don't fit in and that's absurd, then that seems kind of worrying, I suppose, and probably um, the person writing this question is doing the, the good kind by the sounds of it, so. Yeah, really interesting. And, and there we're focusing, it, focusing on it from the perspective of the comedian. But I wonder if we could also think about it from the perspective of an audience member. So for example, am I responsible for the kinds of things that make me laugh? Uh, so, you know, when I'm listening to a joke, should I, should I think twice before I laugh? Do I, do I need to leave space where I evaluate whether it's a kind of immoral joke or not? I'll put that back to you, Zoe, and then we'll move on. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, I think that um, it's, you know, it can be really hard or even impossible to kind of in the moment stop yourself from laughing at a joke, but I suppose that you can be kind of conscientious about um, what kind of humour you're engaging with and you can probably usually know in advance if this is going to be something that you don't want to be laughing at um, and maybe kind of nip it in the bud there and try and kind of get into kinds of comedy that you find more in line with your kind of moral views or something like that. Um, I think, you know, sometimes someone will just make a quip in conversation that you couldn't have seen coming and it seems a bit unfair to hold you responsible for laughing at that. But um, I think in a kind of more in general, you can decide what kinds of comedy you want to seek out. And maybe you are a bit more responsible if you go to a comedian that you know is gonna make a certain kind of joke. Um, Fantastic, thank you. Uh, now I've got a question from Vicky Cleaver and I'm gonna put this straight to Karen. Should comedy make us laugh? Is it comedy if it doesn't make us laugh? Oh man, um, there's, <laughs> there's uh, most, I'm gonna to try to answer all questions by just pointing to bits by standups that, are, that answer them better than I could. But there's, there's, Perfect. A, there's, a, there's an amazing Mike Kaplan, and maybe it's not on Netflix anymore, maybe it's on Amazon. He, has, he had a special in which he starts by saying how unfair it is that comedy is the only art form which has to be good, even in order to just be what it is. Like yeah. you can be a painting and be a terrible painting, but people will say that unless you make people laugh, it doesn't even count as comedy. 
Um, and uh, so, so I, I think my first thought is, though, there has to be room for bad comedy, you know. So I, I'm sure there's co there's comedy that doesn't make you laugh, and it's still comedy, um, <laughs> just not very good. Um, uh, but I mean, I, you know, one of the things that the I, I, Zoe brought up earlier, Nanette, the Hannah Gadsby um, special, and she did a follow up, Douglas. And they both are interesting in this respect. I think what, the thing that I, I slightly object to about them is that she presents what she's doing as a bit more unprecedented than it is. I think there are a lot of comedians who have been doing versions of what she does. Like I think of Josie Long or someone who does comedy that is somewhere between a, a lecture and and uh, and uh, a series of jokes. And yeah, so I think there's a kind of interesting, I don't know, this is really not really an answer to the question, but this the, the whole thing, if, if it is comedy, but there's lots of stretches in which one isn't laughing that are just interesting. And it doesn't seem very important to me whether at the end of the day we say that was a one man show or one person show that was had some funny parts or parts of that were comedy, parts weren't. Uh, I suppose if there was nothing funny about it, it would be hard to, to think of it as good comedy. But um, I think you know part of the power of comedy, especially when a comedian is comfortable and you can you know they can make you laugh, is when they're deliberately not doing that, they can achieve quite interesting rhetorical effects by withholding humor. And that's part of why Nanette is was is so powerful, is that she first establishes that she can make us laugh. So we know she's not it, it's a every time she doesn't, we know that it's a choice that she's not doing that. And yeah, well, whether it then stops being comedy, yeah. I don't. I'm not sure. I, I mind that much how it how it gets classified. Great. Um, if I may put this question to you, I have a question from Julie and Virginia here. Is one reason why most theories of comedy are so useless that comedy is very heterodox and theories try to give a unifying explanation of what it is? Are we wrong to assume that all comedy must have something in common other than that it makes us laugh or smile? Uh, you broke up at the beginning. Was that a question for me? Uh, I, I, I couldn't hear you at the beginning. Yes, if I yes. may put it to you, first of all. Yes, yes I think that, that um, nobody would ever say that, uh, that all music or all poetry is about... Um, superiority or relief or incongruity, or even that it was a safety valve for sociopathic rage. Of course, music can be all of those things, uh, um, uh, um, but it's a million other things as well. But we seem to be very, very, um, uh, but, but, but for some reason, um, comedy really gets in the neck from reductive uh, um, um, explanations. And when the people who say, oh, um, every joke must have a vic victim, uh, remind me of the people, the way that people who don't like dancing very much say, well, you know, of course, dancing is the vertical expression of a horizontal desire. And I think that's because they're at a loss as to why the dancing dancing is, is one of the, the great joys for the rest of us. And they don't know, they can't account for what the rest of us are doing. So, well, of course, it must be a sublimated sexual urge. Now, again, of course, one or two dances are a bit bump and grind. I mean, it's, you know, but that's an estate agent at a, at a wedding reception or a freak, but it's not, but it's, it's a tiny sliver on a very wide spectrum. And it's the, it's the, uh, and, and that, and that, and, and, the, and the, that, 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 um, comedy is much, is, is much broader, but, but for some reason, pe things people would, would, would know sounded crazy if it were said about, um, uh, music or, dancing people feel free to say about comedy and, I, and I'm going to blame the romantics because um like Baudelaire said I mean um, um uh, is it, sorry uh, um, uh, blame, blame Plato but uh, like Baudelaire said um you know laughter is a man's way of, of bearing his fangs and Sartre said oh Baudelaire's idea of comedy is entirely of a piece with his sterility frigidity and complete lack of empathy and of course it's a reaction against the enlightenment because smiling was very big in the enlightenment if you look at photographs uh, not photographs, portraits of the, of, of the philosophs, they tend to be smiling. I mean, that's true of the portraits of D'Alembert, um, Diderot, um, De La Métrie, Humphrey Davy, Thomas Paine, and of course, Voltaire. They're all smiling. And then there's a, 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 a reaction against that. Smiling is out. 
with with romantics because they've seen they've seen the real vicissitudes they've looked deeply into into life and they know you know they've they've know too much about the about about uh, about the ugliness of life to to be to be grinning cock a hoop like these uh, philosophers. But the problem with that argument is, of course, that Baudelaire lived with his mother, uh, whereas de la Maitrie was a battlefield surgeon during the War of Austrian Succession. Oh, fascinating. But, well, there's also a question here from Sally Webmark Taylor, which I think would be an interesting follow up to what you've just said. So Sally asks, what do the speakers think about how often Canadians are associated with depression or insecurity and mask this with comedy and and, and that is a it's a stereotype isn't it the the tears of a clown um do you have any thoughts on that Robert that you'd like to follow up with um um I, I think it's it that, that that's the goes to do with that romantic idea that, that, that laugh is a man's way of bearing its fangs, which comes back as we, with the evolutionary psychology. And I'd contrast that with Darwin's view of it as a joyful meeting. Darwin says, um, uh, and this is, very, this is the, sort of the complete opposite from say Ramachandran or Baudelaire or the, the, the view of the evolution of smiling and laughter. He says, um, Darwin says in, you know, in the 1870s was when he writes about humans evolution and he says uh, our long habit of uttering loud reiterated sounds from a sense of pleasure has evolved into the tendency to contract the orbicular and zygomatic muscles whenever any cause excites in us a feeling which if stronger would have led to laughter and and but as when it comes to laughter itself he says um to return to the sounds produced during laughter we can see in a vague manner this is an expression of the emotions in man and animals he says we can see in a vague manner how uh, um Uttering sounds of some kind would become naturally associated with a pleasurable state of mind for throughout a large part of the animal kingdom, vocal and instrumental sounds are used as the means of a joyful meeting, a joyful meeting between parents and offspring or between attached members of the same social community. And it's, it's so important to Darwin to express the, the sociality of this, that he uses the tautology social community. I know some biologists want to make a distinction between, say, biological communities or uh, uh, between bacterial communities or phyletic communities. But I think because he's talking about the expression of the emotions in man and animals, it's clear that it is a tautology and rather an endearing one. It is as it, as it was as if he knew how it, the, it was going to be turned into um, this very uh, um, uh, atomized, individualized way of, way of looking, things, looking at things. And the reason why Dewey is so good on, on comedy is because um, because he says, you know, society is the is the fact of the case. He, he says that um, uh, so the non-social individual is an abstraction arrived at by imagining what a human would be if all his all our human qualities were taken away. He says um, that so society as a great whole is the normal order. The mass as a as an aggregate of isolated units that's the fiction. But so many when Bergson imagines laughing, it's always from this, this individual flaneur on his own, you know, with Freud we saw four people, only three laughing, it's always an individual fan of watching one person fall over. There's no great room full of 200 people, 300 people all rocking with laughter, all doing the same thing at the same time in the same way. And there's been some very interesting papers recently on, on um, synchrony and, and, you know, interbrain neural synchrony and a great paper by Bromin Tal and Robin Dunbar on, on, on um, silent disco, how um, Dancing in synchrony um, elevates pain thresholds and social closeness. So these are these these, and um, but I think because because they were individualists, people uh, like Bergson, that that's why they comedy escapes them as, and that's why they make, he makes the mistake of saying because he can't use the word funny because that that would be hopelessly subjective, and because he's you know a, a, a rigorous thinker, he, he says. He looks at what is laughable. Now, what is laughable again is a very tiny dot on a very wide spectrum, and it's and it's mockery. And that's where you get this idea: it's the lonely person, it's Baudelaire, and it's outside the crowd. But but you know how that that yes, there's that melancholy. But then the, you just got to listen to the audience, the joy that the audience feel. Say when in the famous sketch where Lucille Ball and her 
co-worker Ethel are on the production line with the chocolates and they say, Ethel, we're fighting a losing battle. And, and just there's just the sound of that, that, that laughter. It's full of empathy and full of love. They're not yeah. saying, ha ha, you hoity toity cow. Yeah. You're, not, you're not married to the woman married to the millionaireist Desi Arnaz anymore. Yeah. They're not, it's just, it's just sharing the, the, all our own humili humiliations with her. And yeah. that's to, I, so, sorry to rant, but I just think that's that, great. That, that, so that that I think the melancholy uh, yeah. uh, comes from the individualism, yeah. and it, uh, and and they're they're inter, they're doing a, 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 a and it, they're they're interconnecting all sorts of ways. Mm, that's really fascinating, and actually that reminded me of of uh, something in one of your essays, Karen, the one on on watching Daniel Ketson's streamed event where you talked about missing that aspect of being together with the audience and that, that kind of communal experience of, of being present. I, I wonder if you might say a little bit about that aspect of, of, of experiencing comedy. I mean, that was just interesting to me because I, I think Daniel Kitson is sort of does these one man shows, kind of quasi stand up performances. Every time I've seen him live, it's been awe inspiring. When I watched it streamed, I was like, eh, it's pretty good. I mean, it's interesting, it was good, it's funny. But, and I could even tell that the moment, there was one moment where he goes into a digression and I just knew that in person that would have been electric. But I was just watching it thinking, he kind of rambled for a few minutes. But in the audience, it would have been amazing. And so it, it was a moment of really seeing, and he, in fact, when he, he opened the, the streaming of it, it was a streamed recording of one of his own performances. And he opened it by saying, basically bemoaning that live theater was screwed. And it's not that I think I'm saying something that he doesn't himself mm. feel, like the, the difficulty of trying to, to do comedy, not live. I mean, the, mm. the other comedian, I, I, I to, to, to stick to my plan of just citing comedians, I mean, <laughs> Judah Friedlander is someone I've seen perform a bunch of times and he has figured it out in that he does smallish Zoom shows in which he interacts with people and there's a kind of new form of crowd work in which he can see into your room and he can see your family members walking around behind you. And he's, a, he's always been brilliant at crowd work, but I felt like, oh my God, this was, it was the first time I felt like there's something new. There's a comedian doing something you couldn't have done pre-Zoom in which he creates a little community. And because he does shows every week, people would come back and I would see people I'd seen a couple of weeks earlier and again, it was this creation of community that is part of the real, I think, consolation and solace of, of comedy. Brilliant. And I think we only have time for one last quick one before we head off. So I just wanted to come to Annie Shepard's question and put this to Zoe. So Annie Shepard asks, why do we think comedy is seen as so attractive? And I'll, I'll switch it slightly to what, why are we so attracted to it? You know, comedians can sell out huge venues. You know, so many of us have tuned into comedy podcasts through lockdown and so on. So some people even write their PhDs on it. So what <laughs> attracts us to comedy in this way, do you think, Zoe? Um, I guess the, um, the kind of simple answer would just be how good it makes us feel. Um, I think comedy is kind of unparalleled in, um, you know, other art forms like can make you feel like really deep and interesting and important things as well. But I feel like whatever mood you're in, comedy will always kind of feel good. Um, you know, you could be in a mood where you don't want to watch something serious, but I think you're hardly ever in a mood where you only want to watch something serious. Um, and I guess the part of it is um, when people uh, make you laugh, what they're doing is kind of um, finding, I've kind of mentioned probably, finding some kind of common ground between uh, you and the person or the audience who are hearing the joke and in so doing I think there's this kind of recognition of the common humanity between you this is something that uh, Ted Cohen talks about a lot um, that when we hear and enjoy a good joke there's this real fellow feeling between you and the person that told it that's like you know I am not alone there is something uh, deep within me that is also within you um, and I think that is a really lovely feeling as well um, to recognize that other people have had those same experiences and you know especially when it was something that happened to you that you found embarrassing or sad or something to kind of see someone else going through that same thing but putting a kind of positive spin on it and being able to get pleasure out of that is is really great I think. <laughs> 
Well, that's a fantastic note on which to end. Sorry, we didn't get to all the wonderful questions. I'll just say that when I told my friend Ellen that I was doing an event tonight on comedy and philosophy, she said, oh, my friend wrote a book on humour and said that only philosophy could make that subject unfunny. Well, <laughs> I, <laughs> I hope that we've at least mildly entertained you tonight. A very warm thank you to our panellists. And and uh, I'm just going to have to say goodbye. Do join us again next Monday. Uh, check out our events and our podcasts on the forum website. And until then, goodbye. <laughs>